All right, so here's, here's my topic. It's a little more uh, focused than some of the talks we've had today. So if you're not involved in soil microbiology, you know, it might not be quite uh, pertinent to your, to your studies, but I hope you, you know, bear with me and, uh, you know, see how it goes. Uh, here's just a brief outline. Uh, I'm just going to go over uh, introduction about microbial communities as uh, ecosystem indicators. What exactly is a CLPP, community level physiological profile, and how it's measured. Uh, and then I'll move into the objectives and hypotheses of my particular work here, and then followed by the methods, uh, brief, very brief results in discussion, because this is kind of a technical methods paper, and then just some conclusions. Okay, so today you've seen a few topics today about uh, soils and their importance on the global scale. And one of the things that kind of drives the importance of soils on the global scales are the microorganisms. Um, so it's generally a good thing to measure them if you want to determine how land use disturbance is going to impact microorganisms because that will probably dictate some other uh, ecosystem properties. Um, the challenge is, is unlike if you're measuring trees or macro, macro fauna, so anything bigger, anything you don't need a microscope for, is it's kind of hard to, uh, to see these things. So how, how do you measure something that you can't see physically with your eyes or in terms of soil, sometimes even with a microscope? And that's one way to measure these is, well, you can use uh, different, a couple of different things. You can do, use things like genetic DNA, uh, indices which kind of measure what's in the soil. Um, you may have heard of phospholipid fatty acid analysis, PLFA, which is another measure again of what's in the soil. Um, but a CLPP or community level physiological profile is more measuring how the community is, is behaving and how it's functioning. All right, and so how does it work? Well, it's this fairly simple way. I mean, the, the premise is simple, it's a little more complex in. in um, in doing it, um, but one way CLPP is basically you take, uh, you have a soil sample, you take a variety of organic substrates being carbohydrates, carboxylic acids, amino acids, just general kind of comp compounds that are going to be in soils. Um, you apply those to a soil microbial community and you basically see how they respond to the treatments that you give, the, the individual uh, organic compounds. And that's, so you measure some form of metabolic response. And there's a couple ways you can do it. Um, the premise being that if a community responds, whatever metabolic response you're measuring, if two sites kind of have a similar metabolic response, you're kind of, you know, making the assumption that they're a similar community because they're responding the same way. So how, how do you measure uh, CLPP, or this concept of what we call functional diversity? Uh, there are a number of ways. The earliest kind of way uh, is the biolog method, which some of you may have heard from before. It's, it's been around for a few years now, kind of came about in 1991. Um, it originally was adapted for identifying single strains of microorganisms, and then uh, some authors, Garland and Mills, decided, well, we could use this in an environmental ecosystem context, so it was applied there. Um, it's nice because it's rather rapid, but it has a few issues with it. Uh, so there's some proprietary substrates, and there's always this thing that's kind of indicative of a lot of microbial analysis is the, um, is the potential for culture bias, right? So you're missing a large portion of the microbial community. You're only you're only seeing what lives on the substrate under certain conditions, so you might, it might not tell you what you think it's telling you. From there, there was kind of, a, you know, the, over time, originally these ideas weren't, you know, these disadvantages weren't apparently obvious at first, which is understandable, it's new. Um, so when the, these kind of limitations were recognized, they kind of moved on to something called multi-SIR, where you're using a soil, so you're actually applying substrates to a soil and then measuring a response, so you're not, you're kind of reducing your culture bias. But the problem with that one was, is there was a lot of, it's very time consuming, consumes a lot of soil substrate to do it, um, and it's 
kind of logistically difficult to try. I, I've tried it, um, and it's not the easiest uh, way to do. And so finally, more recently, uh, 2003, uh, the kind of, I guess, latest advance in, in this kind of method of thinking uh, is the microrest method again. It's measuring respiration as in carbon dioxide. Um, it's kind of combining the biolog approach of using uh, micro titer plates, okay, which makes it quick, but it's also utilizing um, a whole soil approach. So it's kind of getting the convenience of a lab analysis technique with, uh, with hopefully limited culture bias. All right. So it's rather rapid, works pretty well, but you know, what are the disadvantages? Because things always work some ways and a method will work till it doesn't work. So what are the disadvantages? All right, but before I get too far into that, I'm just gonna quickly go over how microresp work. It's, it's a rather, um, it's an interesting kind of ingenious concept. Um, interestingly enough, the original reference was um, um, actually developed in Edmonton. I just found that out recently, and I think that's kind of neat. So the basic premise is you have a, a tube of some sort, and then you have a soil, some kind of carbon source, like glucose, for example, and then what happens is you, you manipulate the system so the soil will fall into the carbon source, begin to be respired by the microbial community, and then you cap the, the, the tube with a um, kind of agar carbon dioxide absorbing gel. And then what happens is the carbon dioxide goes into this gel, um, changes the pH, there's a pH indicator in there, and it causes a color response. So then you can measure the color response to estimate carbon dioxide uh, production. So, a lot of steps involved, it, it, it works pretty well. So how does this work? This is kind of photos of the original system, not the system that I've uh, modified. So you take your, uh, you make your agar dye plates, um, which come in later, uh, but what you need to do beforehand is you take your, your uh, micro plate here, load it with a bunch of different carbon substrates, uh, set up the loading device, Soil falls into the, into the loading device, or from the loading device into the um, deep wells. You cap it off with um, your, uh, your agar plates and then you incubate and then measure that on like a, a plate reading spectrophotometer. So if you have a spec plate reader, it is another analysis you can use um, for that machine. The one um, interesting thing and kind of this is where the, one of the drawbacks come in is you have to sieve your sample um, basically to get it to go through, fall through the wells to fall into the system because I mean these micro wells are pretty tiny and so you have to pre-treat your sample by placing in a sieve before you can load it in the wells um, usually two, mil, two millimeter sieve and for mineral soils this is um, an AE from a, a coarse textured luvasol uh, when you sieve you really don't lose a lot right I mean there's a few pieces of root there but nothing nothing too drastic but when you're sieving something like a forest floor soil, you know, there's not just small pieces of organics. There's charcoal, pieces of leaf litter. So what happens when you sieve that? Well, this is, this is what would go into the standard micro -S method, would be this smaller than two mil fraction. And this is all that would be lost. So I would say that, you know, there's pieces of leaf litter, there's pieces of charcoal, probably important components of the soil being excluded from your analysis. So if you're just measuring this, what are you really measuring is the question. All right, so to get around that, I kind of, uh, uh, we worked on um, modifying the method so it can be applied so you, you capture that uh, part that's lost. And so these are the objectives, develop a method to minimize any homogenization effects when you're screening out other portions and then attempt to capture the full range, range of your soil because it's a very uh, heterogeneous um, type of soil. And these are some of the hypotheses we worked with. Um, we're hoping the modified method will decrease variability among replicate samples. You're using a bigger volume, so you're hoping to capture more of the soil um, heterogeneity. And also, the modified method will be better able to distinguish uh, CLPP. All right, so soil types, I used a wide variety of soil types for this. Um, a lot of different types of forest floor, aspen, spruce, 
uh, some reclamation material just to elicit a strong structural response which it'll show up with the method. Um, and then one thing you'll notice is the uh, here's the difference between the, the volume or weight I should say between the 96 and 24 well method um, the amount of sample being analyzed is almost around a factor um, of 10 larger so a much larger sample to be analyzed which usually is a good thing if you can an analyze more sample so a wide variety of different soil types um, this is just kind of a quick overview of the apparatus I have examples if you want to come see. Um, generally you have the deep well plate, loading device, um, here's the micro plate, the, the absorbing dye and um, the gasket to, you know, so your CO2 actually goes from the well to your uh, plate. So this would be the soil pretreatment with this method, same type of material as the sieving. Um, basically I just filled, took out uh, large root fragments and large sticks. So significantly more um, of the components of the forest floor going into the sample to be analyzed versus sieving. Alright, here's just a quick picture of what the system looks like when it's loaded. You can see here's the uh, deep well plate with the soil inside. There's the gasket and the um, agar plate there absorbing the carbon dioxide. So what you do is you would remove that when you're done your incubation period and then you just read this in your plate reader. So it's rather rapid. You can get a a soil test in an hour and a half you can you can do um, you can measure your um, soil microbial communities on a sample so pretty rapid method and quickly um, just kind of go over the results and discussion this is the one drawback of using this method uh, I am using a larger plate to capture the, all that soil so whereas in the original method you could do a whole sample you could do basically two soil samples on one plate um, because of larger wells I end up doing one sample on two plates so that's kind of the one thing it increases the number of plates you need to read um, but if it measures what you want to measure I think that's a good trade-off and again just quickly go over the um, results um, just comparison of precision this is a coefficient of variation so I should go back really quick um, so this would be one, let's say I use glucose, these three wells would be glucose. So my co coefficient of variation is the, the response between these three wells. Okay, the, the response, the, and how does it look? It's pretty good. It's pretty, you know, your lab reps are pretty low, you're around 5% coefficient of variation. But even the, the standard micro method was still pretty low. But a little bit better. So around 5% for the 24, my method and the traditional method is around seven so they both still work pretty well pretty reproducible results that's okay but how about when you actually look at you know can it measure what you want it to measure okay so here we have blue is the 24 my modified method green is the traditional 96 well method um, this is a uh, non-metric multi-dimensional scaling ordination so basically points that are closer together are similar communities that are similar to each other all right so the farther points are away from each other the further um, the further you get from the communities being similar okay and as you can see here the 96 well method um, the communities all grouped rather closely you know potentially as that artifact of sieving where you're basically only screening out that portion of the forest floor Whereas the 24 well method where you've retained bits of charcoal, you know, leaf fragments, things like that, there's a much wider spread in the samples. Um, in terms of what kind of makes sense, it's interesting. A and B would be like air dried samples, air dried forest floor, you can see they kind of group closer together. Uh, D is a mineral soil which you can see is quite far away from everything else. Uh, H that's another uh, forest fl uh, aspen and C, E and G are actually, or let's see, C is G and E. So G is a uh, forest floor, jack pine, E and C are um, again some mineral, mineral type soils. So there is more spread with the 24 well uh, system compared to the 96. All right, so conclusions just to keep on time. Um, kind of relating it back to my hypotheses. So the modified method 
will decrease variability among rec replicate samples, hence increasing precision. Uh, it did compared to the traditional method, but the traditional method still worked all right. Um, so if you're you know, using mineral samples, the traditional microRESP works just fine. Um, however, the modified method will better distinguish community level uh, differences among soil types. And yes, if you look at um, the ordination, it definitely did um, distinguish between differences that were there. So I just quickly like to acknowledge uh, support. Uh, of course, uh, Sylvie Quiro, this is the work I did during my postdoc in her lab. And uh, the, the funders that supported this work were uh, NSERC and the Canadian Oil Sands Network for Research and Development. All right, and just references in case you're interested.